Thank you for attending our workshop. Our title is Native People Speak Out About Native Mascots. My name is Evelyn Meltingtello. My mother is Blackfeet from, um, from Browning, Montana. My father is Blood from Staniff, Alberta, Canada. I am the American Indian Student Advisor and also the American Student Alliance Club Advisor at North Idaho College. And how this all began is that we were asked to participate in Footsteps. Well, so Footsteps is a journey of many programs it's designed to give participants a very direct, emotionally impact learning experience around issues of diversity, differences, oppression, and discrimination. And the room is set up to five to six installations that are darkened but lit up when a group views the room. Each installation is only three to four minutes to educate the group on the topic. We, the club has been doing the footsteps for the last um, three years. And the first one we did was on, um, on uh, sweatshops. And so they did an excellent presentation. And the interesting fact about the footsteps, which we have in uh, March, and we run it for three days, and we usually have over 100 plus people go through it, is that um, you are only allowed three to four minutes, three to four minutes to give your topic that emphasis to hopefully change or make somebody think about some of the issues that are occurring. So I would like to turn this over to Sari Mays. Good morning. Um, my name is Sari Mays. I'm a Ford Lane descendant. I'm also a recent graduate of NIC. And of course, a continuing student. I'll probably never get out. Um, I'm also the new Indian Education Liaison for the Coeur d'Alene School District. So everything is really tying in really well for me. When this subject first came up, it was really interesting. I'm not a sports fan, so I really didn't know anything about the mascot issue. I was really just ignorant of the, the whole subject. Um, we started talking about it in footsteps, and when I began the research, I was really amazed and I was shocked. One of the first videos that I saw was a man, and he was wearing a full headdress, and he has war paint, he's got a tomahawk, everybody's yelling. And just in total disregard for the culture, I, I was just so shocked at this, I had no idea that it went on. So it made me stop and think, and I really wondered, how couldn't I know about this? Well, how could I be that blind if it happens all the time, that we're representing our culture that way, or others are? And then I, I started thinking, how could anybody see this and think it's OK, and just keep continuing and continuing? Well, as I kept doing research about it, I found a study that was ended in 2010 and it concluded that the child's racial perspective that he would have for the rest of his life is developed by age three. And part of my research led me into commercialism and how a lot of the products and advertisements we see, the images that are being put on the project products are seen by children. And like the movie Pope and the caricature that's on that, and what are we teaching our children to see, and how is that being passed on? And I started thinking about my grandchildren, and they watch a lot of sports, so they're, they're getting this message of the, real, the mascots pretty often. And if I just agree and do nothing about it, then what message am I sending to them? Am I saying it's okay to dress up like a silly Indian and stomp around and raise a tomahawk? Is this how I want them to have the perspective of themselves? So I really started to question this. And if I ignore it, then I'm telling them that our history and our tradition is not important. And that all of this is okay. And it's okay to treat people with this honor. If that's okay for us, then it's okay to treat black people in this way, it's all right to treat Asians this way, and none of it in advertising is appropriate. 
So I decided that I had to draw a line somewhere. That it it's not really black and white, but it's either okay or it's not. You can't be a little bit is okay. One feather on a mascot is okay, but ten aren't. It's either okay or it's not. So I decided that if I didn't draw that line and make a statement and really try to do something about it, then I was letting the whole stereotype carry on into the next generation. And then my children would be teaching it to their children. So I decided that it's not okay. And I'd like to introduce TJ Gosser, who will tell you his reasons for doing this. Teen drug use is twice the national average. 
murder and rape rates are high, and contrasting that are really low conviction rates due to state to federal to tribal laws that are sort of contentious or, you know, hinder appropriate trial time. And the poverty rate for single race American Indians is 29.1%, the highest in our nation of any race group and among some of the highest in the world. That reservation average is at the 44th percentile internationally. So here in the US, one of the world's superpowers, we have the 44th percentile of poverty. Uh, the history of the US forcing Indians into reservations with little resources has outstanding effects still to this day. So I don't feel as if it's a matter of whether the history is behind us or not. The third conclusion my class came to was, who cares? Aren't there more important issues that we should be concerned about, like global poverty, malnutrition, or global warming, or the war? Outside of the politics and the science behind those topics, which are contentiously debated and often confused, I don't know why that should be our concentration as students in a college class or just as people in general. Yes, they are very important issues to know about, but to make a change <coughs> is literally a career field in order to make a difference like directly to the problem. The issue with the insulting mascots isn't that it's going to destroy the world or kill millions. It's that a solution is extraordinarily tangible and it represents a larger issue, which is the plight of the modern day American Indian. The longer that those arguments actually hinder making progress to the change of getting rid of those mascots, the more that the voice of American Indians is ignored. Americans have nothing to lose with the change of the mascots and names, while those very identities being represented have their respect on the line and their honor. Even if the mascots somehow aren't disrespectful, making up reasons not to change the mascots is, and that's why I wanted to raise awareness through this project of the disrespect inherent in the media. This brings us to the visual presentation of the exhibit. If you can press the next button on there, or click. Yep. Um, there were three sections to our room and a spotlight unit was set up so that each one could be illuminated and then doled individually and sequentially. Uh, the first was composed of posters comparing reality to the stereotype, which are all right there. Um, the second was an exhibit of items that are commercialized and you can see every day in stores that exemplify stereotyping. And then the third was of the mannequins over there, and that's where we spoke directly of the mascots. Emily will be speaking on the mannequins. Sari will be speaking on the items, and I'll be speaking on the posters. Uh, they were all illuminated in accordance to an audio track that we'll, we will play later, uh, speaking about each individual exhibit. Preceding all of that would be a video that we will play later. If you have any questions about our information, we have a printout of all of our sources right there in front of us, and can provide that for you immediately. Or you can give us your email, and we can send you a list of all the sources. So. The first of the posters is concerning regalia and dance. It is the third in there, third from the left. Um, the now defunct chief, the now defunct uh, chief of Illinois had a sort of trademark dance of crossing his arms before his chest and stomping around. Uh, judging from the colors he's wearing, they were attempting to capture a traditional, if very cliché. Uh, image of an American Indian. However, there's little conceivable discernment of what exactly the dress was for. It's not exactly battle regalia, which would be more understandable if battle regalia were a more clearly defined tradition, nor is it prepared for dance. And neither of this, those scenarios would grant or welcome an impersonation. The thought that goes not only into dance oftentimes, but how the clothing is composed and works into the dance as a storytelling device as well, is and was oftentimes fully realized by the person who was doing the dance and composed it as an art form. Sometimes the outfit itself would work to tell a story. And regalia for dance is often really elaborate and very bright. As for war culture, the greatest and most widely applicable tradition lies not in clothing but in the face paint. And face paint will cover in greater depth later. Regardless, this profiling of a warrior would still be greatly insulting as there are still Native American warriors today and they're not going wah, wah, wah or painting their face. And it's hard to tell how often their ancestors even were. The culture in these cases has been simplified so much because I'd say it might be an assertion, money hungry sort of tourist attractions, grabbing iconography of the plains or from Pacific tribes and then just sort of mixing them together and putting them out there as tourist attractions. Um, the diversity of American Indians in general renders any of those reputations though further invalid. Each individual tribe has its own culture and its own history. Uh, 
And then we compared the Redskins logo to Chief Joseph to stylistically relate the faux sort of wisdom inherent in it to the real thing, and maybe to imply just why. Why two feathers and why one pointed downwards? It's just there's no weight to it. It's an oversimplification of a culture. And it's just sort of there. They're just throwing it there to be an identity and just to be there, something memorable. <clears throat> And then lastly, there's the Pocahontas comparison to a dancer pictured at a powwow. Outside of the inaccurate historical portrayal of a female, which will be covered later in the video, evidently the Disney image of a wise American Indian female being pandered to children is more sexualized as well as more culturally s simplified, well, vastly, in comparison to the real image next to it of a modern day Indian. These all lead to falsified identification of American Indians, as well as perpetuate and cater to an audience that has no concern about their history. American Indians aren't a product, and that's the main point that I need. So the part of that we were talking about is the uh, creation of some of the things that we have. <coughs> So the, the, the mannequins that we put up here, and one of the things that we have realized is that on the next exhibit that we have here on the Victorian cards is that I'm going to have Sari go ahead and talk about some of the items that we have on the table before we go into the mannequins and the mirrors. I think it's important to know a little bit about the history of how we got to the point in commercialism that we're at now. It really came about about the time that Native Americans were safely put onto the reservations and they were considered no longer a threat, that Victorian trading cards came out just right about the same time. And it was perfect timing to be able to use the mystique of the Native American in their advertising. They were very lush, very graphic, postcard size advertising, and they were given out as premiums. Most people couldn't afford to buy any kind of, you know, real colorful imagery for their homes, and so they would collect these cards, and it was a, a family pastime to sit down and put them into scrapbooks at that time. So they were really valued, and even today, the graphics that are on mostly the um, cigar boxes and the trading cards associated with that that are of Native Americans are the most highly valued and highly collectible in the world. And some of them are going for as much as $20,000 or $30,000. Um, at that time, they were the most important form of ads. And they, they kind of catered to this real carnival-like fascination that people had with imagery at the time, especially with Native Americans, and it really catered to the racial attitudes that they had. They also used blacks, Irish, um, Chinese in that imagery, and all of it together, they kind of marginalized this group of people, and it helped to create this new sense of a white American identity. The squaw became the Indian princess, which was seen as a natural, innocent, pure figure, and was used to really represent those kinds of products where they wanted to imply that they were very natural. The male became the noble savage, who was portrayed as brave, a picturesque warrior. He was always dressed in feathers. And these images are really what cemented in American minds the stereotypical Indian images that we see today. They were all started during that era. The myth also included the notion that Native Americans were more natural, and therefore they were more in tune with healing. So this whole mystique worked together to make just a perfect advertising campaign for the medicines, the snake oils, the tobacco products that were being used, and those really still continue. Some of it was dropped off, but you especially see it on tobacco products all the way through the current time. So advertising was used partly um, as a vehicle for cultural assimilation, 
But at the same time as they're doing that and trying to make it look like we honor the noble savage, they're actually saying, but you're separate. So they're creating that real sense of separateness out of the whole thing. Today, companies still continue to attach these images to products, and people associate certain images with those products as being, you know, kind of relating them to Native Americans. In the products that we have up here, which you're welcome to come up and take a look at afterwards, um, one of the most prevalent that we see all over, every grocery store has it, is Land O'Lakes Butter. The Butter Maidens really gained popularity about 50 years ago. Land O'Lakes hasn't really changed anything hardly in 50 years. They updated the picture a little bit, added more color, made it a little bit more sexual. The only thing otherwise that they changed was the size of their package. So they've used that same package for over 50 years. As far as I could find, there are no tribes in Minnesota that are in the dairy business or have ever been in the dairy business. So it's highly unlikely that um, any tribes okay that. The Indian Princess popcorn, I'm assuming, that the Indian princess is used because, according to some history, the first Indians brought corn to Thanksgiving. That's about the only association I can see there. Subi honey is another product everyone is pretty familiar with. And originally, the Subi Honey Company was named for a group of honey growers from Sioux City and named after the tribal, you know, the tribe of the town. But later on, they did change it to SUE, um, claiming that they were only doing that because it, it suited their product better. They no longer use an entire Indian maiden figure. They have made it half be, half human, and in one of their statements said that since it was not entirely human, then it couldn't be considered racist. So I guess it's okay if you're only half human. The trinkets that are up here, there's quite a few different ones. There is a shot glass that is highly offensive. Um, Princess Plenty Feather, which is a corn cob Native American figure. These were all sold as trinkets, which started in the 50s, and they're still being sold today. In fact, I found the shot glass on eBay right now selling for $10.50. So they're very available. And finally, the Arizona tea. Um, everybody's familiar with Arizona tea. And I always thought of it as a company that was probably interested in our health. You know, they, they tend to put out stuff that looks pretty good and sounds pretty good and healthy. We're going to drink that as an alternative to pop, maybe. But when I started doing research, I found out that the Farolito Voltaggio & Sons company that started this was actually a brewery. And in the beginning, they marketed in the Bronx, New York, mostly in the poor areas. They went house to house selling beer at really low prices, really high alcohol. One of their big hits was Crazy Horse Malt Liquor. Um, over the years, they were sued quite a few times. They eventually were banned in several states from selling Crazy Horse. The family of Crazy Horse's being has been suing them for several years, trying to prohibit the use of their name. So in the meantime, they formed another company. So they're the parent company of the one that now makes Crazy Horse, still being made. But since they're only the parent company, then it's no longer the problem. With the Arizona tea, the pina colada that is up here, the figure that they use on it, which, which they've kind of used in other forms along the way, shows a really skewed image of a male native, you know, full headdress. But he's, he's skewed just enough to make him look like he's probably in top. And I want to read a story that they are associated with. They did not write it. Um, 
It was a review written by a group called Thirsty Dudes, but it is linked on their website. So I can't imagine that they would link it directly to their company if they didn't appreciate it. So it's the Pina Colada story. You know who loved Pina Coladas? The Indians, Native Americans. Sorry, you think Arizona just arbitrarily put an Indian on the bottle? They had to earn it. For hundreds of years, Native Americans would ride on horseback from New Mexico to Puerto Rico in order to get authentic Pina Coladas. The horses never liked riding on the boats, so oftentimes they would have to let people in Cancun borrow their horses until they got back. They would come back and there would be ponies since they were gone enjoying Pina Coladas for so long. Once in Puerto Rico, they would order coconut after coconut filled with the milk as well as ground up pineapples and the finest rum that not a lot of money could buy. They would fill their back sacks with coconuts right off the tree and pineapples off whatever pineapples come off of, I assume trees as well. When the Native Americans heard that Arizona was making Pina Colada, they jumped off their horses and rode to Arizona, only to find out that Arizona is actually based out of upstate New York. They decided to just call them using their cell phones and thank them. Well, Arizona was so happy that the Indians liked their drink that they decided to take the Stacy Keach off and replace it with the Indian leader at the time. So this is where, where the logo came. They thought that Arizona did such a nice job, they put one of their horses on a plane, shipped it to New York, where Arizona built a nice employee ranch where they can go during lunch breaks and ride it and feed it out of their hands. So, I find that highly offensive. Um, they are being boycotted, have been for quite some time. And I really encourage you to rethink it if, if you are still drinking Arizona tea. <laughs> that maybe with this type of advertising, they might not be the company you want to support with your money. There's, there are a lot of different companies that do this besides these. Um, I kind of want to point out again that the, the one study that I found that points to children learning their racial perspectives by age three. This is the kind of advertising that they're seeing all the time. The Pocahontas movies, the Arizona tea on the shelf, the Land of Lakes butter that's in the fridge. So these are things we really need to think about if we're bringing them into our homes and maybe have those discussions with our kids. So there are a lot of other places, you know, where we see commodity racism. There's Umpqua ice cream, there's cars like Dakotas and Cherokees and Pontiacs. Um, who decided that that's where, where the name should come from? So we see it every day. It's right in plain sight, but we don't see it. So I'd like to turn this over to Evan. So one of the things that when we were doing our research is that we wanted to be able to, and it was hard for us too as a committee, to purchase items that we felt were very offensive, but we needed to be able to have that shown in the footsteps. So we went on eBay and purchased the items that you see on here, like the red skin shirt, um, the uh, uh, Atlanta Braves, and then also the, uh, the Indians on there, the caricatures. Because these are the things that, that as TJ and Sari spoke about, these are the things that, that we see every day and that, that we sort of just brush off, you know, that, um, that they're not offensive, but they are. But who are they offensive to? And, in, and as TJ explained before too, it is that if it's offensive, why don't we do something about it? So in the, also the other thing that we have on there, the mirror, and um, um, Sari uh, painted the mirror, and the reason why she did that, and because, is that when you look into that mirror, 
and we asked the people when they went through the footsteps before they left our uh, installations to look in the mirror because that's the image that you're giving us, that's the character that every time that you look in the mirror that's reflecting back to you, that's how you're looking upon us as a character and not as a real person. So the other thing that I wanted to be able to talk about too is the um, is the footsteps uh, presentation. On the footsteps presentation that um, you're going to be watching here is a video that was created in audio by T.J. Sari, Taylor Abrahamson, and Christopher Rendell. That was an experience that when they went through this, this was experienced by over 500 student, staff, faculty, and community members from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. So we'll go ahead and go through that. stereotyped and underrepresented Native Americans in today's culture. Discrimination is a common topic in the modern arts, but the pleas of the modern day Indian are greatly overlooked and seem to inspire little sympathy. For example, did you know that historically Pocahontas was a nickname given to a girl named Matoka, which meant that she was dirty? She had no romantic history with John Smith and was captured by colonists a few years after John Smith left and was animated in films with a body type that is Caucasian. Do you know that the headdresses seen on mascots are rarely seen in tribes because it is symbolic of great achievement and is a status of great respect? Did you know that war paint was usually composed with great care and depth to represent the life of the individual wearing it? Did you know that this doesn't represent the modern day Indian? Misrepresentation is rampant these days and yet the actual controversies vocalized by Native Americans are rarely heard. Here are stereotypical items purchased from local stores. Note that Arizona only used Native American related marketing for the Pina Colada brand and warped the face of the native, making him look cross-eyed and seen through a drunken hazy filter. Also, the Orlando Lakes Butter Girl is nothing but a made-up character displaying a falsely idyllic Native American girl. The presence of her skin is also unusual. More often than not, traditional female clothing consisted of a skirt and leggings, while well, most shirts, if worn at all, were long-sleeved. But the underlying question you should be asking yourself is, what does butter really have to do with American Indian culture? It doesn't have anything to do with it, and the imagery isn't respectful. These team owners have nothing to do with Native Americans and have never cared to even ask permission to use these stereotypical names and images. Even after causing endless controversy within the American Indian community, Team owners still insist and defend that it's a respectful representation. If it's so respectful, then why are there national campaigns to change the situation? These images and names carry negative meanings for many Native Americans. Words like redskin, engine, and squaw are demeaning and always have been. Squaw is a word that, though innocent in its conception, went on to be used derogatorily. It was used to indicate women of a secondary class, someone who was ugly and wretched. It was then further misinterpreted to mean vagina, and then derogatorily adapted as such. There are no longer mascots using the word squaw, but the term redskins is still dominant. Term redskin is equivalent to the N-word for African Americans, and also misguides people into believing Native Americans are primitive and warlike. Using the term redskin leads others to stereotype Native Americans in the wrong way. We have the same hopes it later became derogatory and has historically never been used in a positive light. Look in the mirror at your own image and imagine your identity being represented to the world by a discriminating stereotype, 
without your permission, without your history, and giving you a name you don't ever want to be called. Please help to change the mascots. One of the people that has been a leading force is Charlene Teeters. She is a Spokane tribal member and, um, and she's internationally known, nationally known for her advocacy for changing the mascots and bringing to life some of the things that we just talked about today. She attended uh, University of Illinois in 1988 and she was recruited. She got her bachelor's degree in, um, in New Mexico in the Santa Fe Art Institution. And so her and two other classmates that she graduated with went to the University of Illinois to get a master's in art. When they were there, they noticed because they were felt pretty much that they were only natives on campus. And you have to realize the population there at that university was 36,000 students at University of Illinois. So, and a lot of the racial things that was occurring, they would have to face every day. The caricatures, that some of these things that we have showed you, realize that when you step on your institution that you are getting your education from, is that you see that and how you feel when you walk into it. And they actually was a bar there that had a, um, a sign where it would, the caricature was a Native American with X's in their eyes and that the feathers bent and you see that they, they fell down. Kind of a drunken Indian kind of thing happening. And then they actually would have a squaw um, fair kind of thing where squaw princes, so then, and then the swarties would do a contest to be a squaw princess. And then the other character that we see over here where you have the chief, the one that they had, Chief Ilwaka, that you would see would they, he would wear eagle feathers. So 90 eagle feathers and the feathers would be on the ground. So the first gentleman decided that um, he wanted to do something so he wrote uh, a letter to the editor for the school newspaper. And he was the only one that was on campus. The other two were off campus housing. So what happened because, and remember there's 36,000 students there, and so he was taunted. He was taunted so bad that he left in the middle of the night back home, packed up his bags and left. And Charlene and the other classmate found out the next day and they tried to go to the person who recruited them and they pretty much said, you know, shut up, just get your degree and then leave. But one of the things I think changed things around and uh, reading an interview from Charlene Titters is that one of the key things that changed things around for her was her children. It was in middle school and high school. She took them to a basketball game because the Illinois, University of Illinois was in the final four. So she took them to a basketball game and she tried to explain to them ahead of time what they may see. But what she's seeing through their eyes and, and how it affected them when he came out in the regalia or the costume and danced around, they actually sat down and kind of went in themselves. And seeing the physical hurt that has done to their children, then she could no longer step back and not say anything, shut up and get her degree. So then she started the campaign. So she's been really a huge advocate to change the mascot and other things that has occurred. So the last thing that we would like you to watch is in the Super Bowl, Seahawks, yay, won. But in the Super Bowl, they were trying to raise, you have to realize that a one minute commercial in the Super Bowl is over a million dollars. So they were trying to raise over a million dollars so that they could show this commercial or change the mascots so the nation can realize about the Redskins part of it. But before we do the change the mascots video, I want to explain a little bit so that people will understand why the Redskins is so offensive, why the students said 
it's like for African Americans, the N-word. In 1755, King George II of Great Britain, known commonly as the Phillips Proclamation, ordered the colony's government to pay 50 pounds sterling for scalps of males over 12, 25 pounds for scalps of women over 12, and 20 pounds for scalps of boys and girls under 12, Native Americans. There were also bounties, too, that was posted, and also in newspapers, that if you were able to get a scalp or actually skin the body, that they would receive a reward. And some of the skins that they skinned, that they get the rewards from, they made shoes and bags and belts out of. So that's why it's so offensive when people say redskins. That's where it came from in 1755. So now I would like to show the video of Change the Mascots. Proud. Forgotten. Indian. Not all. Blackfoot. Inuit and Sioux. Survivor. Spiritualist. Patriot. Sitting Bull. Hiawatha. And Jim Thorpe. That was yesterday? That's really last night? That was last night. Okay. <clears throat> That's incredibly great. Uh, this needs to be shown in so many different venues. Yeah, That's it's, it is venue. really a powerful video. It is. Evelyn is going to pass around some flyers that we did that went along with the Footsteps program. Um, the Indian, American Indian Student Alliance Club put these together um, just to encourage and, and inform people about Change the Mascot. There is some organizations listed that have, it has this video listed along with a couple of others that are really excellent and the changethemascot.org um, site that just has an incredible amount of information on it. And also a list of some responses that we can have that, that might possibly help make an impact. Um, and it tells a little bit about our club too, I believe, on it. So um, we'd like to open it up to questions and maybe we can give some answers. If not, it's probably much time. Well, I, w I want to bring up one thing that um, 
that the Indian education, and then uh, Joanna, she just walked down. Just walked out. Okay, maybe you can say something. So one of the things that was addressed, in this, and this is what I would like the, I would like the group to know this is that because of this, and because of things that are occurring in Idaho. In, in the nation too, but Idaho here for our Indian Education uh, Committee is that they are looking to write a statement concerning this. And so we here have been asked to address in October the uh, State Indian Edu the State Education Board of Idaho on this presentation. And then we are also asked to do this again in December. Is that correct? Yes. So it's, it's, it's an information item that will come to the State Board of Education um, in part to uh, get home educate and inform them exactly what the issues are um, in regards to uh, cultural uh, insensitive or sensitive um, issues. And to, before bringing them forward uh, with the recommendation, we would like to present them with just a, a broad spectrum of information about this issue um, before the, the committee brings forward an actual statement or recommendation in December. So the intent is the community education committee, uh, Indian Education Committee, will come kind of prepare a program, if you will, of information that will be presented to the board as an information item in October that will help put all of this in context to them, um, and then that will then help inform them as they uh, bring forward any type of recommendation or suggestions or just information to help educate them because um, while we have a committee, we have one board member that is on that committee, so we do have one board member out of eight that is informed and we don't have the other side of the board. By doing this presentation, we're, we're, we're bringing to uh, their attention some things that probably need some attention and, and they don't have it all in full context. And so by doing this, we're able to do that. So we are hoping that um, this presentation we did for Quiz Sex, like I said in the beginning, is that it was 3 minutes and 50 seconds, and then the panelists here, we went in detail on the research that we have gone through, and it, and, and it has been life-changing for some of the students here, and emotionally for myself too, to, to see how the students have developed this and put it together, and also some of the commentary that we have had Remember, I spoke about 500 people going through this and having people actually say, you know, like one of a uh, student came up to me who was in the English 102 class that said, yeah, that they were against, you know, the mascots and that I don't, I don't know why you guys are up in arms and you guys should get over it, pretty much. And that's what she put on her Facebook. But after, when she went through the installation, she came up to me and she said, you know, she goes, I'm changing my footstep, I'm changing my uh, Facebook, and I get it, and thank you. So I'm hoping that we will be able to do the same thing in October. So I ask for any commentaries or any suggestions that you have for our presentation, and I appreciate you listening and understanding the, 